80 years ago, the land Acma occupies was a field of apple trees, adjacent to acres of horseradish. 80 years from now, our little art school, a magical place sprung from modest beginnings and grand ideas, will have celebrated its 100th anniversary. It's a community that really, you know, everyone supports each other, really cares about each other, and it's completely unlike anything I've seen anywhere else. Arts and Communication Magnet Academy stands now on a threshold of an adventure. We look back on the grand history of our school in all its incarnations, revel in creative present that we helped to create, and turn our eyes forward to the possibility of our artistic future. To appreciate that future, it's helpful to go back to the start, that open field. The land that ACMA stands on used to be an apple orchard under the name Ruchek Farms. In the late 1940s, Joseph Ruchek Sr. sold 10 acres of the orchard to enable the C.E. Mason Elementary School to be built on a section of the land. That school building would eventually become ACMA close to 50 years later. The elementary school was named after Curtis Eugene Mason, a well-respected member of the community. Born in 1880, the son of William and Isabella Mason, Dr. Curtis Eugene Mason, a prominent physician of Beaverton, spent his boyhood in Missouri. But he started out as an educator, as a teacher, and this is one reason why he had an interest in education. For over 14 years, C.E. Mason was the only doctor in Beaverton, delivering over 2,000 babies throughout the course of his career. On June 23, 1920, he was voted director of the Beaverton School District in a landslide 102 to 9 vote with the promise of ensuring that Beaverton schools were as good as those in the big city. Dr. Mason's pursuit of quality education for local students, including his own kids, helped to define the school district he was helping to lead. According to the November 1949 issue of the school newspaper, Livewire, the new elementary school was named and dedicated to C.E. Mason at a PTA meeting on October 25, 1949. By January of 1950, C.E. Mason Elementary was getting overcrowded and so, on January 25th, the school district board members voted 215 to 76 to approve a $150,000 bond to add nine more classrooms to the building, as well as a library. Builders also added a play structure north of the assembly room at the same point in 1950, which stood until replaced by our familiar Quonset hut in 1958. By September of 1951, the construction was complete, giving the school a total of 18 classrooms. Inside the building, a team of educators greeted students with the energy always present in a new school. Principal Esther Peer was the first administrator in the building. In late September of 1949, she completed a teacher's monthly report, showing a total of 198 students attending the elementary school. She oversaw 11 teachers when C.E. Mason opened its doors in the fall of 1949 and presided over the hiring of a few more as the school grew. You can see living memories of the original C.E. Mason building in its current incarnation. A wooden door here, a fixture there, the assembly room's wooden floor beneath the carpeting of today's library. A decade into its life, C.E. Mason Elementary was an established school showing children how to behave in the world around them. Looking back at photos of students from across the years is to see youth in what the country was like through the Cold War and into the turbulent 1970s. In school pictures, the collars widen, hair lengthens on both boys and girls, and formality gives way to a more colorful world. By 1973, however, enrollment at C.E. Mason had dropped below 400 students, and in June of 1974, it closed its doors as an elementary school. That's not to say that C.E. Mason ceased to exist. In the fall of 1974, the building welcomed students from Five Oaks Intermediate School, who stayed for two years as their new campus was being built. It was a new life for an old building, a renewal of sorts that would help to define our campus for the rest of the decade. On September 4, 1974, 285 students from Five Oaks moved onto campus, determined to make it their own. The Quonset Hut became home to the basketball team, gymnasts and wrestlers, and outside, administrators bundled up to supervise students in the rain. Greenway Elementary School followed Five Oaks, filling the building until their school was completed in 1980. C.E. Mason opened its arms to students of many experiences, challenges, and backgrounds over the next decade. Starting in 1980, the old elementary school was known as the Continuing Education for Young Parents Program, or CEYP. It was also home for the Beaverton School District's Talented and Gifted Program. The basement, now the counseling office, and once the cafeteria, held a nursery for children from one month to six years old. 
1987, the building was upgraded with a set of state-of-the-art portable units to house extra students. The next few years marks the transition of a campus from serving elementary students to seeing teenagers at C.E. Mason. This little campus was about to be changed by one of the most powerful, transformative powers around, art. September 8, 1992. The grand opening of C.E. Mason Arts and Communication High School. Approximately 150 high school students came that anxious Monday morning expecting something different than the ordinary run-of-the-mill, preppy high school that most of us have more or less attended in utter boredom. You know, since the early 90s when ACMA started as Arts and Communication, there was this spirit of, well, let's try. What if we just, what if we tried? What would this be like? I think that sense of adventure, artistic adventure, and open-mindedness, and uh, excitement about having everybody in on the, on the journey, I think that that's what makes ACMA ACMA. And it doesn't happen without people. In the fall of 1992, our little art school burst into existence with a flash of color. While the school kept the C.E. Mason name on the curve above the front doorway and the powder blue trim around the building, inside the hallways resonated with teenage voices and the classrooms became places where students created art. Those students, so very many of them sporting flannel shirts and mischievous smiles, drew, wrote, and worked with clay. They painted, made music, and lived life unconventionally. When graduation arrived in the June of 1993, about 20 seniors crossed the stage. They smiled for cameras, hugged one another, and left their mark on the DNA of our school. These founding mothers and fathers the first to jump into the unknown that would become ACMA prepared the way for every student sense who has taken a deep breath, looked out at the world through artistic eyes, and decided that they wanted something different. Um, the kids were crazy, funny, goofy, just like they are today. Um, and uh, we had a lot of room though. You know, only 214 students just spread out on this campus. It, it, it didn't feel so claustrophobic and cramped. We didn't feel like we were um, um, on top of each other. That's kind of like how we feel today. And then in February, we had an alumni event. And alumni came in, and there were some from CEE Mason Elementary and a ton from the early uh, years of arts and communication. And to take them through the hallways that some of them hadn't been in for you know, decades, for them to walk through and say, oh, I know who did that mural, and do you remember when? And they pointed out little details about the paintings on the walls and the school uh, that were just so real for them. And, and sharing those memories, I think, I'm gonna miss that. By the spring of 1994, some of the most iconic murals were up in the hallways, all variations of Mona Lisa, wearing flannel, as a dog, as an abstract version that hangs near the Tom Marsh Gallery today. The 1994-1995 school year marked a turning point for arts and communication, with the graduating class being the last of the original test group who opened the school. In 1995, for an art school housed in a building that was constructed as an elementary school almost 50 years earlier, having an art gallery meant making an art gallery. In the fall of 1995, it was arts and communication students who rolled up their collective sleeves and transformed a space that had been an office and switchboard room in another life into something special. When it came to naming the gallery, the choice was easy. Tom Marsh was a member of Arts and Communication's original core staff, and his student-centered approach to education helped shape the school. With a perspective on governance, learned in part as a member of the Oregon House of Legislature from 1975 to 1979, he didn't just teach government and civics, he lived them, and he encouraged his students to have a voice. You can spot Tom Marsh in student films from his time at ANC, usually playing the heavy in a parody of some kind, advising James Bond, counseling Luke and Darth Vader. Today, the masks that the students put on the wall above the Tom Marsh Gallery are still there, and they'll be brought with us to our new building and reinstalled exactly, exactly as they are now in the fall of 2021. Even more than the classes offered, ANC was defined by its culture, and as a former student explained, once in, it was easy to find oneself in something of a culture shock. At Arts and Communications High School, it was normal routine to see students sprawled in the hallways of sketchbooks, teachers and students engaged in conversation about current affairs, and groups of teenagers with colorful hair, unlikely piercings, and countercultured fashion mingling in the student lounge. It was the late 90s. Teenagers were fighting their subcultures. There were ravers and industrial kids, goths and punks. 
There were people who wore capes and those who spent their days devoted to artistic pursuits. What we didn't have in academics, we made up for in social and emotional education. It was in high school that I first saw democracy in action. Students were allowed to take risks and make mistakes. We painted murals to make our environment reflect our interests and sense of humor. The late 1990s saw big changes at our little school. And to do that time justice, it's important to look not only at the official history. ACMA has an unspoken history that most don't remember, and if they do, they probably gloss over. Right now, I see how quickly all the things that have made CE so admirable are diminishing. There are moments when I walk down the hall and feel like a stranger at a school that I've felt at home in four years. It's as though the halls don't want to keep me in their arms anymore. They only want to push me through. After all, it's not the halls that made our school what it is, but the incredible people inside of them. Now many of those people are gone, and those still here are lagged down with that same feeling and have little energy to hold on. This energy has been the life force behind our school from the beginning. Without it, it's doomed for failure, no matter what form it may take in the years to come. There's no question in my mind that the spirit of C.E. Mason is on its last legs. This friend that we have all grown so close to is dying. Ellen Greer, 1998 to 1999, Arts and Communication High School Yearbook. Not even 10 years in, changes came to C.E. Mason that radically changed the life of students. Magnet Academy got added to Arts and Communication, and with it came policy changes about maintaining a specific grade point average, auditioning to get in, and more. One student from the time called it the domestication of arts and communication. Others chose words that shouldn't be repeated in a school documentary. Even years later, for many, their memories of school are complicated and understandably sad. The majority of the things that I considered fundamental to the social aspects of the school that really saved my life um, were kind of stripped away from us before the school year even started. I came here the following year, immediately we got this letter in the mail that just kind of said, here's all the things that uh, we're taking away. Of course, it didn't say it, it didn't frame it that way. Here's the changes that we're making. One student remembered the school altering change that occurred when a new policy required all students to retain a 2.0 grade average or be told to leave the school. Students who fell below the 2.0 received a letter informing them that they were no longer allowed to be at Arts and Communication High School. The parents had uncovered the story, the narrative, which was that she had been hired to turn the school into a money maker was like the expression that they had used. Um, so all the changes that she had done was like for that end. They were basically like, what's your one change you want us to reverse out of a dozen changes? And the reversal that we cherished the most, the, the program that we cherished most um, was Ohana. And so me, the catalyst, as a catalyst to bringing my friends together and bringing our parents together, we're able to um, protect and save Ohana from disappearing. That the school was probably both saved from its destruction by that person and simultaneously um, the people who fought that person's changes kept the, the soul of the school here, um, at least in, in some part. It would be less than five years until another tragedy struck the school. On July 20th, 2003, a tour van rolled on I-5 south of Portland, Oregon killing three members of the rising power pop band Exploding Hearts, all of whom had been ACMA students. Their debut album was described by Pitchfork magazine as an awesome power pop record that would have been just as relevant and engaging 25 years ago, and will undoubtedly be just as fun 25 years down the road. A full-length documentary of the band has been in the works for several years and is set to release this year. The full trailer can be found online. But despite the challenges facing the school, the students at ACMA did what they do best, create. Beneath the circular portico from which the word C.E. Mason had been removed, life kept going at Arts and Communication Magnet Academy. Look in the Savant, ACMA's new school newspaper, and you'll find a two-page spread on the music scene at our own rock and roll high school. By 2003, student artwork had returned to the pages of the yearbook. By 2004, the silly photos were as silly as ever. Visual arts and creative writing swelled in the curriculum, right beside those advanced math classes the student editor from 2001 thought would never happen. One of the fundamental changes in the opening years of the 21st century was the emergence of dance at ACMA, and Dance West in particular. Over the years, few programs have matched this pre-professional company, which has launched students into careers of dance. This edition of More Performing Arts broadened ACMA's creative world. In 2002, an ambitious inner thematic project was conceived, which involved acting, dancing, and song, 
all in the service of celebrating the history of a visual artist, Frida Kahlo. A teacher who was there at the time described it as what capstone was before it was capstone. It was a requirement, but of the whole school, the entire school participating with one theme at the center. It was written and performed by ACMA staff and students, filmed by ACMA kids, and produced with images developed by ACMA artists. In 2002, Kahlo's view captured the artistic energy of a school driven by creativity. From 2002 to 2012, Walton Valley Community Television operated out of the ACMA building, turning what is now the library into a TV studio. Satellite dishes were installed in the courtyard that broadcast across the entire Portland metropolitan area. Students would use the space and equipment to create ACMA news segments about ongoing events around the school, and a TV studio class was offered where ACMA students created sketches and documented life around them. In 2012, TV CTV left ACMA, taking the satellites, equipment, and shed along with them. Uh, my worst memory of ACMA was when we had, it was 2012 when we had so many district layoffs and it didn't move teachers out of our building very much but what it did do was pack kids into classrooms at ridiculous numbers and we were all dealing with 40 and 50 kids per room. That year was hard to get through. When I had one class that had 50 seventh graders in a room you know, built for 30 maximum, and the other classes were all big too, but that was the biggest one. Um, that was really hard to get through, and we lost teachers uh, at the start of that year, before that year started too, so. And it, you didn't feel like an effective teacher that year, um, and I'm concerned that's coming back. The people, uh, both the staff and the students make this place special. Like just just all the life experiences I've had over the past years have made me grow a person, uh, grow as a person and as an artist, especially. Um, the teachers, I really like the teachers. They're very funny. They're really cool, and you can. I don't know, we have that. I think a lot of students are really close with them because ACMA is so small, and you get to have that one-on-one -on -one time with them and. That's what makes ACMA really special. The solidarity between always being in the school and how we always kind of hate it, but at the same time we can never think of leaving it. Um, there's this kind of weird personal connection between all the students in the building, um, which I think is kind of nice. When, when I At my previous job, uh, I played in a band and my neighbor across the hall taught Spanish and he was the drummer in the band that I played for. And we used to sit around after school daydreaming about what if we could teach you to school where art was at the core and everything else we taught was approached from that core? And I literally ended up working in my dream job. People here, like, when they want to try to find um, a safe place to be and they want to try to find their way out of, like, really bad times, they create and they do art. And I feel like we all have that community where we all want to create something.